you were in either of those dependently typed talks this morning and you felt that it was going over your head at a kind of space level altitude, then we're going to be cruising at a lower altitude today. I hope that's good for you all. Um, uh, I'm a big believer in small stuff adding up in programming. Right? I, I sweat the details because the devil is in the details and certainly the bugs are in the details. Right? So I like to look in the small and see how that can build up to the large. And that's what I want to talk about. Um, oh, make that a bit larger. OK, please, read those two messages as quickly as you can. It's tricky, isn't it? Let's add syntax highlighting. Can you now read those two messages? You probably can. But by adding in color, it makes it easy to pull apart two different messages, right? Let's go from that into Java and have a look at our friend. <laughs> Because you can't always use the abstract proxy factory bean, which is everyone's second favorite. Abstract singleton. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> oh, I won't be able to meet that bean in a pub anymore without being embarrassed. Um, here is another type signature from Java land, of course. Again, it's kind of hard to read because you've got a couple of messages going on at once. Right? We add in syntax highlighting. That's what we all do. And it becomes a bit better to read. But in some languages, they take a different approach. Um, in some, the I we separate out the type signature into the concrete and the abstract. Uh, that's a, what happens in the ML family of languages. So you've already seen that in Idris today, Haskell, PureScript, um, Elm. I want to try and convince you that this is not just a matter of taste or style or syntax. Pulling apart the abstract from the concrete is technology in itself. This is a real, for me, this is a step forward in programming because you have the ability to consider a function just from its type signature and start to think about what that means to the design of your system. Um, I want to give you some examples about considering that, thinking about it standalone as a pointer to where, towards where your software can be better. So, crash course in reading these for anyone in the audience that can't. Um, can we have a quick show of hands? Who is happy with Haskell, Elm, PureScript? OK. So for the two people left in the room, th this is saying, oh my, is my laser working? Yeah. So this is saying, I've got a function called repeat. It will take an integer and a something and return me a list of somethings, right? Just from that on its own, without looking at the implementation, you can start to get a sense of what it's going to do. It's taking a number, it's giving, taking a thing, and producing a list of things, a sequence of things. You can start to get the sense that, yes, this is probably the right shape of function on an abstract level. Um, so I do most of my work in front-end Elm programming, so let's start with a problem I see all the time in the real world. I would like to. What this is saying is, if I emit this magic series of HTML, then I will get this on the screen. right? Um, and the code looks like this. This is, if you've ever written a few of these in a real project, eventually someone comes up with a helper function that looks like that. It's very simple. Uh, you just get the magic class names right, and it renders the way you'd hope. Um, the problem with this is we're being too vague. It's a really, really general function because it takes a string and returns another string. It's about as broad a function as you can imagine. Um, and this will go wrong. This will go wrong in two ways that I see all the time. Ooh, that's very yellow. Is that a bit better? No, no, no sorry. OK, hang on. There. If this were statically typed, none of this would happen. Hang on. Here we go. I am going to do, it's because I've commented it out. That's why it's, OK. So this is a problem I see all the time. When you call this function, someone gives it a typo. So the class name is wrong, so it doesn't render the way you hoped, right? Straightforward error. Um, this is another one. So someone says, oh, well, let's abstract user to be a variable, and then we can't get the typer. We can't make the typer. 
and you end up with this lovely thing because people forget if you've called icon already or not. I've seen this in the real world. And so you end up with a class name, which is glyph icon, glyph icon, glyph icon, glyph icon user. <laughs> which is just, and, and it breaks the front end. And that's where you get really embarrassed, because you, your users see you not being as competent as you wish you were. But to go back to this slide, I didn't even need to see the errors. I didn't even need to see the implementation. I think you can tell something's going to go wrong from this function just by looking at the type signature. This is incredibly vague. This is, this is saying any possible string in the universe will return any other possible string in the universe. There's no specificity to this at all. Um, you know, it could take the documentation for Angular and return a Kafka novel. Um, so how can we tighten this up? String to string, that's not what we really want to do. What we really want to say is, give me something that means an icon and return some HTML that we can render. This is a much more specific function. Um, here's the implementation detail, but it's, it's really about tightening up this to this. Now, it's actually very hard to get this function wrong now. It's very hard to call it with something that makes no sense. And it's very hard for it to return something that won't actually produce what semantically we meant. We've gone from this universe of almost any function would satisfy this type signature <coughs> to something that's very specific. If we get the implementation right, we'll use it correctly from now on. That's a very nice property to have. So th the point here is the type signature was telling you there's going to be a problem with generality. And it's, it's correcting the type signature that outlines what the solution should be. As um, in the other direction, types can tell you when you're being, uh, sorry, go back. So um, I'll give you another quick example of that. This is one that's real world code. I've seen other people's code as well. Um, you've got a URI coming in from a single page web app and you have to convert that into which page we show the user. Um, this is probably how you'd end up doing it in Angular, something like that. Uh, and again, it's a string to string function. The difference here is the, stri the string that's coming in is coming from the user. So legitimately, it can be anything. And it's the return type we need to tighten up. Now this becomes something that's very hard to get wrong at any point in your program. So we can tighten that up by looking at the type signature first and asking, is this specific enough? On the other hand, oh, you all know this. You're all Haskell programmers. I'm going to tell you anyway. So um, as a bonus to doing it that way, the compiler can now actually help you. It can look at rendering code and say, you've actually missed a case. I can, I've narrowed down from the universe of possible strings to only four possibilities. And the compiler can say, well, you forgot to deal with one of the possibilities. Which is really nice whenever you've used a website that forgets to have a proper error page. You know, that's very common. On the other hand, instead of being more specific, the compiler can help us be more vague, more general. Um, for instance, uh, I wrote this code a while back. It's a helper to display HTTP errors. If you uh, make an AJAX request and it goes wrong, this is a helper function that just spits it out in a nice way with a title and an error, right? But it occurred to me, maybe I should comment out the type signature, which is beautifully unreadable, and ask the compiler, well, what does the compiler think about my type signature? because it's, it's nice to work in a world where the language itself has an opinion on what your type signature should be. So instead of deciding ourselves, we can ask the compiler. And this, in this case, the compiler says, if you give me a string, this, this code really has the type, if you give me a string and anything, I can produce HTML. So it's saying, don't be so specific there. This can be actually anything, and the code still works. So there's a design choice to make. Do I want to make the type, do I want to make the code more specific to match this type? Or do I want to make the type more general and come up with a reusable tool? Which is what I decided to do. And then that makes me think, well, actually, the name's wrong. I can make another design change. And this is actually 
by asking the compiler what the type of my code is, I realize I've made a general debugging view in my front end code. So your types can point you towards reusable tools by showing you where there's more generality than you thought, as well as making you more specific about what you're talking about. Um, here's one more real world example I've seen in code. So um, this is some code that encodes product IDs. Right? We've got a bunch of product IDs that we need to send over to the, the far end of the world. Um, in this particular case, it was querying out for a list of the user's favorite clothes. And this code says, OK, I'm going to get a set of integers, turn that into a list, sort that list, encode each item as an integer, and encode that whole thing as a JSON list, and then I can spit it over the network. But looking at the type signature again, there's something, there's something, it's whispering to me, this type. Types often whisper to me. And this one, this one, of, this one says, whenever you've got code that says, here's something about a collection and the specifics of the content of that collection, you're almost always doing two jobs at once. You're almost always saying something about sets and something about integers, which could be teased apart. So in this code, we did tease it apart. We said, if you, if you pull out the integer part of this, you end up with something. And, and then if you pull out the integer part of this, you've just got something that transforms sets into JSON values and doesn't really care what's in them. And then we can make our product ID encoder as a simple function of that. The type signature gets more complicated, but we've got a reusable tool just by looking at this set type here and seeing what can be pulled apart. And then we go and grep through our code base for places we've used the far too specific type and reuse the tool. Because grep is still an engineering tool. So there's a couple of simple examples where you can look at the type and think, think, can I be more specific? Can I be more general? And can I be less coupled? So um, those are just looking at the type signatures for functions. Let's have a look at some type, sig type signatures in models, um, which is particularly interesting if you live in a mostly JavaScript world like I do where there isn't really a way of talking about the shape of data, not in the same way there is in something like Elm or PureScript. Um, this is something you see a lot in JavaScript land. So I want to load a list of people from the server. So I'm going to hold a list of people and potentially an error. Um, and I start off with my list being empty and my error being the empty string. And this inevitable, this, this there's, there's something weird about this, and you can see the symptoms of it all over the internet as the bug where you're shown you have zero users until the load completes, right? Or uh, you'll see this on the, tw the Twitter client. M most, um, the web Twitter client will, when you load a tweet, it says you have zero tweets, and then half a second later it pings in to the correct number because it started with the empty case as being a default. But you can see this can be a mistake here just by looking at the types. Firstly, error as a string, that's desperately vague. Let's make that more specific. That's something we did at the start. String is a, generally a terrible type unless it really can be any possible string in the universe. But another problem we have here is we're saying that it's valid to have a list of people loaded and have an error at the same time. What does that even mean? I've loaded five users and I say network error. That doesn't make any sense. It's meaningless. And that's going to translate into someone writing a view that displays both at once or just doesn't add up, doesn't make sense to the user. Um, and you ask, well, how can I fix that? The expensive way is to let your users tell you that it's broken. The slightly less, exp less expensive way is to get QA, QA to tell you. The slightly less expensive way than that is to be disciplined about unit tests. Um, but the cheapest possible way to fix this is to say, 
this data model doesn't make any sense. You can just say, we can introduce a type that says it can be one or the other, but not both. And I'm lucky, because everyone in the room knows enough Haskell that I don't have to, all I have to say is that this is Elm's either type, right? And everyone's gonna be happy that this isn't either. And we've constrained the model down to only some states that make sense. Um, I would actually go even further than this, because when you first, this is saying that either we will have an error or we will have a list of people. Well, that doesn't make sense either. We can keep looking at the type and say, can this, can this represent a sensible world? Well, it doesn't, because when we start, we're either gonna have to say, we've started with an error, which is nonsense, or we're starting with an empty list of people. That's not true either. When the app first starts, we don't have an error, we don't have an empty list of people, we have nothingness. We have to find a way to represent that. So, okay, introduce a maybe type, a maybe a of a result of blah. But I think there's a better way to model this. Um, and I think this works really nicely for single page web apps, that kind of world that I spend a lot of my time in. We can say, okay, let's use the type system to model what's actually happening with a web request. When we first start, we, ha we, have, we haven't asked for any data. Then there's a period where the data is coming in. We're loading it up. And then there's either the notion of failure or success. But only one of those can exist at any one time. And it's slightly more complica complicated in the front end than the back end, because in the back end, you probably wouldn't worry about the loading state. You just wait for the data to come in. But in the front end, the user actually cares about a loading message. So we can model this whole thing as, as a kind of a process, not the dependently typed process um, name. Edwin mentioned early, earlier, that would be nice, but even this is a massive improvement on the chaos of JavaScript land. We can actually say that there are defined states and only one of them can exist. And then again, we can go to the compiler and say, I'm, I'm a very disciplined front-end programmer. I'd handle both the success case and an error. That counts as a bump <laughs> front-end programming, I'm afraid. So you end up with a system where the compiler will drive you towards a better, more usable user interface, which is nice, which isn't happening in the front-end world. So, those are some front-end Elmish things. Quick pause. <laughs> and um, let's talk about some more fruitier stuff you can do in Haskell. Um, perhaps I should pause and see how, see how you react to this, Jessica. So, um, everyone, someone's gonna ask it, so I'll just say Elm Haskell some people say that Elm is a dumbed-down version of Haskell. I think it's a more accessible version of some of the really big ideas taken into a world that really, really needs those ideas. <laughs> but if we're going to do some fruitier stuff, it's time to go to Haskell. Or are there any other fruitier type systems like that? Phil, do you know any? <laughs> Idris, thank you. <laughs> you didn't get your script. <laughs> um, Wild, unconstrained effects. Let's talk about those for a bit. So here's a, a Java database call, right? You can say, execute query. It will take a string and return a result set. Let's convert that into the notation we've been talking about so we can think about it. If this were Haskell, I would be missing a, sem a colon. If this were, if there were an extra colon there, what this function is basically saying is, execute query is something that takes any string and returns a result set, right? Um, but really, it's not. It, it's, it, it introduces a concept you can't have in Java, which is this function is really saying, if you give me a string, I will give you a result set by doing absolutely anything I like. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 it's reasonable to expect it will connect to the database. But it might do anything else. It will probably do some logging. It might connect to our Kafka system for audit, auditing all the queries that run. It probably, sooner or later, 
connected to that microservice that only Jeff knew about. Jeff left the company six months ago, and the system's just gone down, and we found out why. You know, this is, this is the sudo of monads. This has permission to do anything it likes. Um, in, in a language that introduces this concept of how the result will be calculated, we can narrow this down very nicely. Um, to have a look at that, let's look at how you'd actually use this. You'd probably end up with a function that said, fetch a user, I'll give you your username, and you can give me a user by doing anything to achieve that. In Haskell, we can constrain that more usefully and say, give me a username, and I will give you a user by doing things that only concern the database. I can constrain down the scope, the footprint of that function to, you can do anything you like as long as it's database related, rather than you can do absolutely anything you like. We've, we've narrowed down not the, number of, not the inputs and outputs, but the space in which it can operate. That's a nice constraint to add. And if you were feeling, um, if you're feeling really thorough and had the time and no deadline pressures, you might then say, well, I'll give you a username. You give me a user back, but you can only do read-only type queries. That would be a lovely constraint to have. That would really narrow down what this function means. And so this is something I did last week, and I think it's a good example of it. Sorry, I thought it was a question. Um, to take that to the, the logical extreme, where you narrow down this space of what a function can do by looking at the type and saying, hang on, this is way too general. I don't want to give these permissions to this function. So the other day, I was writing something to try and download tweets. It wasn't the most important project in the world, but I was doing it. And um, I needed an OAuth library. And the OAuth library took some OAuth stuff and credentials and a request and gave you back a signed request that would let you access the signed Twitter API. And I was very uncomfortable with this because I looked at the type signature, as I always like to do. And so this is just signing a request for security purposes. And it has permission to delete a chunk of the file system. That's weird. That's really weird that we would give I.O. capabilities to this simple request signing code. And it needs something like it because it needs access to the current time. Fair enough and it needs access to a random number generator. Fair enough, but I, I'm not comfortable giving it such a wide sandbox of permissions, which is something that monads can give you. They kind of give you a concept of sandboxing your code. Um, so I sort of wish the function signature were, ended up in just request to request, but it can't be because I need timestamp and IO. Uh, sorry, I need timestamp and random number generation. So what am I going to do about this third-party library that has, to my mind, the wrong type? Uh, I could do a pull request. I don't want to. I could hunt for a different library that does it the way I think is right. Mm, there weren't that many Haskell Twitter library options. Um, I could suck it up, which is, is a fair choice. You know, it's, it's no worse a guarantee than I'd have in Java. Um, but there's quite a nice way of allowing it to keep the same code and the same type of signature, but constrain it back down, which is, uh, I'll, show, I'll take you through the step of a series of transformations. First, instead of saying IO, instead of saying this function needs IO to achieve its goals, say it can achieve its goals by, with anything that has the same capabilities as IO. I'm not going to do an MTL tutorial, but you can just take it, Take it from me that what this is saying is go from the sudo monad to something with sudo-like permissions. Right. Then we do another transformation. Well, actually, I think this is way too general. I'm going to narrow that down to I just want this to have permissions to sign no auth requests. That's all it needs. It doesn't need anything more than that. Let's narrow it right down. How do I make that actually work? Well, I'll define what I'm defining what the permissions of signing an OAuth request are. Um, if, it can, if it can sign a request, then that's good enough for me, I'm saying. And I'm saying that the way we implement that is, there are different ways to implement it, lots of different ways. I'd have a different one for testing. 
But in the real world, I'm just going to say, if you've got access to I.O., delegate it to this same library. What's the point of doing that? Because the knock-on effect of this code, and that's what I really want to say in this section, we can go from the library that calls this, sorry, the part of my code that calls that OAuth signer, say, instead of saying my fetch user request takes a GitHub config and returns a request in the world of permission to do absolutely anything, without changing the underlying library, I can say, if you give me a GitHub config, I can return a request constrained to only requiring the kind of permissions that OAuth requires. So without changing the underlying call, I've massively narrowed down what my, my low-level function needs. And that has the knock-on effect of all the parent calling functions not needing, needing access to this wide permission sandbox. Which is nice, because the permissions you need at the low level cascade up, and the ability to constrain it back down means that the, the size of the problem space in my code gets much, much smaller. I have to say, given the room, um, if you were writing this in pure script, you would have other options for how to do that. You get this bonus coin if you know what those are. I've got to ask. Who doesn't know how to do this in pure script? Oh, crikey. <laughs> I would have guessed two, and I only got one right. In conclusion, so there's a bundle of different examples there, but they all boil down to these three points. Listen to your type signatures. They're trying to tell you things that can improve your code. You know, they can tell you where you're being too vague. They can tell you where you're being too specific. But they can always tell you something. If you look at them, they can tell you something about your code standalone without having to consider the implementation. Listen to your types because they're telling you something about your model. And that's telling you something about the reality you're working in. Uh, in, the, in the end, so much of programming comes down to, I have to represent the real world as a program. How am I going to represent it? And your types can point you towards nonsensical states, which will save you enormous amounts of work if you fix them today rather than down the line. And in some languages, you have the ability to constrain what the function can do to achieve its task. And that, again, massive, massively narrows down the problem space that you're dealing with which is great. Choose a language that helps you do that. That's my final advice. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Glenn. Uh, oh, oh, hang on. Do we need a microphone? Is there one? <laughs> I just repeat the question. Okay. Same. So like request, request. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so the question is, uh, if we take something like this, this is going from a request to a request. Should it be something else? I think, I think there's a definite case that we could take this even further and say that we should make a distinction between a request and a signed request. I don't know what, the, what happens in OAuth if you double sign something. Does it just... Does it just replace it? But I shouldn't have to worry. I'd be much better off with enriching this type even further, being even more specific to a point where I can't double sign a request because it no longer fits in this function chain. That would be a good thing, yes. Um, and the larger point there is there's always a trade-off between how much do you enrich these types versus getting on and shipping something. Um, and the answer is in the state of our industry today is an average more. <laughs> Any others? Okay. I'm really curious about the, the pure script, the bonus coin. I want the bonus coin. And we have like 10 minutes. I. Well, you want me to type that? Yeah, but yeah, go for it. Um, well, yeah, my, I, I use Emacs, but I set it up as Vim. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. 
The Reverend Mother will now... <laughs> um, that's a comment, but the other stuff should be visible. Okay, so, essentially, it has to come in with this negative function. Side effect. Um, What's it called? What's the thing? Sino. Sino. Yeah, that's good for some. Sino. So it had what? Um, Monad or? Oh, no, no, no. Like the Iowa one. It's oh, um, request to Iowa. Credentials request to Iowa. Request to Iowa. Request. So the thing here is the, um, the Iowa Monad. Yeah. Which is what signifies the side effect. That means we go off, do some IO, and then magically we have a request. And that's what the type of signature says. When I say pure script, it would be shape. What's the matter? Uh, <laughs> on your way to get mad. Is it a command? I, my fingers now, I don't know. I'm just going to control K. I'm, I'm hoping this isn't cut up. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to? <laughs> shall I drive? Yeah, maybe. Get so, yeah, my phone back, please. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's going to be. <laughs> 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 um, Sorry. So, are you going to say? Um, so, what I was about to say is that in in. And we also have uh, road polymorphism, which means that we can do this kind of type argument. And, and, and thus we refine the f and of saying exactly what it does. IO is a bit... So how, how do you narrow down IO? That's the question. Yeah, so this would be usually specifying what sort of type of x is going to happen to the segment. It usually depends on... So we want to end up with... <coughs> Something like this, I guess, where we'd say how to do that is left as an exercise to the reader, I think. <laughs> there you go. Cool. I'll see you all in the pub later for figuring that one out. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>